thanks for stopping in. I'm Sergio. I'm going to be your story host. Because <laughs> we're talking story, I want to talk a little bit about scenes and how to break down some narrative content in a storyboarded scene. That is, uh, you know, it's. I think it's the reason I was thinking about this is because it's one of the most basic things that we do as story artists. Like sometimes you'll get a chance to do your own short film and you worry about the whole project. But I think what we really want to be talking about is the elements that we can control. And we do a shot, and we do a scene, we do particular actions within the scene. So that's what I want to be talking about now. So bring your questions and let's chat about that stuff. All right, great. Layered 96, thanks for joining all the way from South Korea. That's awesome, my friend. Chad, what's up, man? What's up, buddy? Good to see you. Uh, I hope everybody had a nice holiday in the United States. We had the 4th of July Independence Day, which uh, for me was pretty chill, which was great. Uh, I always liked that, kind of cool and calm. Um, but yeah, let, so the reason I was thinking about this is because I've been watching a lot of movies lately. Uh, maybe you guys have been doing the same, like on Netflix, you've been, you know, with the, the lockdown or whatever, that you have some time at home, hopefully, to look into and research and do some more like film studies. And I've certainly been going through a bunch of movies, and that's really been cool. Cheers, my friends. Get a little bit of water. Okay, so and then I was thinking about breaking down a scene because that's really uh, that's really the the just the nitty gritty of what we do as story artists. You got to learn how to handle a scene. Okay. What do I mean by that? So a scene is going to be a building block that's got to be pushing the story forward. And really, you have to justify the existence of the scene and a character and the characters within your scene. So, if what happens in the action within that scene, if that doesn't push the story forward, to me, that is a big sign that you should probably rework the scene or get rid of it altogether. You just cut it out of the project. And now, this could be an episodic feature, short film, whatever you want to do. But any kind of narrative thing, each scene has to turn. It's got to have a conflict that actually pushes the story forward. Now, when I say have to. Um, these are all kind of like loose terms. So there's no really like hard rule in any of this, but the traditional way of doing this uh, and traditional way of realizing and executing uh, a project is by having conflict between your characters that is in a particular set piece and within a scene. Okay. So if we, and there's a good argument for why that exists. There's a good argument for why that, that formula and that kind of uh, method repeats itself over and over again because without that you don't have an entertainment element for your audience and it's just going to be boring now you may have seen like art films or like um i don't know some like avant-garde stuff that doesn't have a real through line element with characters involved and it's not like that traditional three-act structure those things are great and that's totally valid but one thing that i think is really important when you do that kind of stuff if you if you get rid of the scene structure and you get rid of like the three-act element of like one, two, three, building up to the climax, you might risk losing your audience. And so this is why I encourage everybody to learn the form first, right? It's like riding a bike, learn how to ride first before you start racing or start jumping or doing any of those like crazy tricks, learn the structure, learn the form first, and then you can go on and do uh, a little more elaborate and crazy things, right? So everybody wants to be Chris L Nolan and make memento but you don't actually understand how you get things in line first, right? Get that right. Now, in a scene, when you're going to break this down, what you want to do is also think about that there is three-act structure within a scene. So um, let's define that a little bit. Hopefully, you guys know what I'm talking about when when it's a when in, uh, when I say a scene, right? This is a a location where where an action or a conflict occurs between two or more or between one or more characters, I should say, because you can also have a scene with just one character in it. And, uh, but typically it's like between two people and you get into a room and they have some kind of discussion or argument. You can also have an action set piece and within that action set piece, there should also be conflict and there should also be a little bit of, there should be stakes involved because otherwise, like I said, if you have nothing writing on the importance of watching that scene for the audience, if you get rid of it, they're just going to be bored. It's not actually pushing anything forward and revealing anything new. That's what people want. They want to get into that experience and learn what these characters are doing. And they love those reversals, right? That's why those those movies, like, um, I still remember how shocked everybody was when, like, The Sixth Sense came out 
and M. Night Shyamalan had that that really like strong reversal in that film. I didn't think that film was all that strong, but everybody was blown away by the fact that they didn't see it coming that Bruce Willis was dead, right? So these are things that, that happen, and those things have to be set up correctly. Now, think about this when you do your scene. Is there a beginning, a middle, and an end? So when you board out an idea, don't just go linearly, you know, and you're, you're working in a straight line, and then all, all you do is you, uh, you just do one action after the other. You kind of have to think about this and plot it out in a way that one, one particular moment will lead to the end, so you know where your end point is. So, and the, the, real, um, the real basis for this is you have to have a change from beginning to end. So the, the scene begins in one way, and it ends in a different way. And this is typically what's done. Now, there are scenes that you can start in one direction, and you can end up in that same direction. But there has to have been a path that these characters or you know the, the protagonist goes through in that scene to actually get back to point A. Right, but typically what you want to do is go from point A to point B, and there's a big change in there, or you know, relatively recognizable change, right? So it doesn't have to be huge and ginormous. The world comes apart or something like that, especially not in every scene. But that something happens where you reveal a little bit more information, and that's pushing the characters forward. And there is a beginning, a middle, an end to each scene. So, and think about this in the bigger picture of stuff. So if in your, in your film or in your story that you're trying to tell, there is also a beginning, a middle, and end. And so that beginning chunk will have multiple scenes. And then in those scenes, we'll also have a beginning, a middle, and end, right? So you're reducing this to like uh, micro units of storytelling, okay? Now, why am I being so like, um, so adamant about this stuff is because I see a lot of examples where things just don't change, they're not developed very well, um, there is no conflict necessarily. So this is another thing that I really encourage people to study and think about when you, when you get down to, to structure is to know what your conflict is, like literally write it out on the side of your script or on you know somewhere on your desk, pin it, so that you can really identify what you have to prove in that scene. The conflict is character A has to destroy the robots in, in that scene. So you have an action set piece and you know what has to happen and you go at it and there's a beginning, middle, and you build it up to, to the end of the scene where either he's successful or he's not, right? You kill the robots or you don't, <laughs> for that example. Now it could be a little more subtle, right? Even in subtle scenes, you might have a dialogue sequence with somebody uh, sitting at a kitchen table, but there's a conflict. There should be a conflict there. And at the beginning of the scene, uh, maybe a character needs to reveal to the other character that they're going to leave town. And that's something that the other character does that, doesn't want the protagonist to do. So there's going to be a conflict and resistance there, and you have to show how the character is going to reveal this information. And at the end of the scene, it's done, and you get the reactions of both characters, right? So you build this up. Now, the reason you need to do this is so that it fits correctly within your story, and then you have a really nice structured story that's really interesting. Um, the way you're going to execute this is what comes, what you're going to have to bring to the table, right? That's where your creativity comes in, and you have to bring your ideas to actually resolve this scene in a cool and interesting way with staging, with the way the characters move around the set, with how you're doing your camera work. Are you doing long takes? Or are you doing quick cuts? You know, those are the things that you bring as a as a as a filmmaker, really, and as a story artist to uh, add your own personal stamp to that particular scene. And these are all ideas, and there's a big collaborative effort, so if you're working with animators or you're working with live action actors, they're also gonna bring something to the table to finally execute the scene. But that conflict is what you establish. That is what you're gonna set as a story artist, and that has to go all the way through no matter who is acting or animating your scene. They have to make sure that they realize that stuff. So hopefully this is, uh, this is not new, to, uh, to you guys and that you understand what's going on um, within the structure of a scene. And if it isn't, you know, certainly let's throw out a couple questions and maybe we can have a discussion about it because I really think it's important that uh, we all identify these things and we can clearly see them. So as I'm watching these movies and um, uh, I'm, I'm breaking down these scenes, it's, it's cool to, to identify these things like, oh yeah, this is a really cool way that they actually turn the scene. That's what I say when I... That's what I mean when I say turning of the scene where there's 
there's a conflict involved that now pushes the next scene forward. And then you have to, as an audience, audience member, you're waiting to see what happens next. So, there, and there's another couple tricks that I think you probably inherently know about is like leaving an open loop, right? You start a scene and at the end of the scene, you open up a new idea that you're gonna close somewhere else. So you leave like a cliffhanger and then you don't necessarily close it in that scene, but it's a new element that everybody gets, let's say, shocked or surprised by. And then the next scene that you cut to is something else. So you have multiple leading open loops, or let's say cliffhangers, that you eventually have to resolve, but you don't have to resolve them all at the same time. So that makes for good storytelling too. This is why it's so important that you break these things down and make sure that you, you know what you're doing when it comes to, to understanding these things, right? So, um, Cool, let me get to some of your comments and see if, uh, if we're on the right track with some of this stuff. Um, yeah, cool, so Chad, I love it that you're, you're having a conversation about, about scenes. And you right here, breaking down not just the classic scene, but also the ones that didn't quite hit. That's a super awesome exercise, especially similar, similar scenes to learn and understand why one thing worked and another didn't. You know, watching bad films is actually a really interesting and fun exercise sometimes <laughs> because you can think about how you would do it differently and i think that that brings out the story artist in all of us like we're you know the storyteller we want to like look at movies and uh and figure out how we do it well how we do it better and we had this exercise in one of our courses which i thought was funny so if you if you watch um like halle berry's uh, uh catwoman is like one of the <laughs> notoriously bad movies that um, that we actually started breaking down and we, we asked people to, to do a new version of the scene. But when I actually looked into this, when you look at the films, they're actually well shot. They're actually well technically, they're, they're well executed technically. So what what is failing there may not necessarily be the acting or the cinematography or, or the action. It's it, In my opinion, most of the time when things like that fail, it's because of the ideas that are inside of the story. So, I mean, Halle Berry, I think she's won Oscars and stuff for, for her good acting. She just had that film that is not one of her better known, let's say. And people harp on that, like Catwoman movie. But you look at some of the scenes, you're like, hey, you know, that action is actually not that bad. If you look at it just isolated within a moment. But then it's the ideas of why the action is occurring that, you know, just don't make any sense. So I love, I love that you're going through that, uh, Chad. That's awesome. Let me see what, what else you're saying. Um, Omar here is asking a question. From your experience, what have you seen that has worked best for storyboard artists to start storyboarding the script from beginning, middle, or the end? Um, so let me see if I can answer that. Uh, I'm gonna take that in chunks. So that's a really good um, idea when, uh, or it's a, it's a really good question, and the idea here is that you, you have a film and you're gonna break down, so, it depends obviously for a feature and for like episodic, it's a little bit shorter, or if you even have a short film, which could be like a five minute film. But within that, you're gonna have, you can always, almost always break this down into act structures. So that's why I say beginning and middle and end. That's usually like act one, act two, and act three. Now you can break down act two and it can have multiple um, sub acts, so to, so to speak. Or you could have the whole film have a multi-act structure, so it's not just one, two, and three. It could be like seven, eight, and nine. So um, some people have broken down uh, the Rages of the uh, the Lost Ark, you know, the Indiana Jones film, the first one, and it it you can look at it with the action moments. It almost ha it almost has nine acts in it because of the way that it's paced. Um, so one way to break this down that is a way that I think is is smart is that you take the most important key moments of your film and you really identify where it has to go so it's almost like plotting points on a map so you have this, the film and yeah you can you're going to eventually fill in the whole map so to speak the whole points that you're plotting but the climax for me is one of the most important things that needs to get resolved really really well otherwise everything else that's pointing to that climax may not necessarily work okay so one of the things that I like to do when I'm breaking down a story is understanding um, where the end point would be, like what the character and the protagonist wants, what's gonna set them in motion to actually get that desire, and then where that leads to where's that big payoff. And is it multiple payoffs? So you can have 
you know, like I'm saying with Indiana Jones, you can have multiple little climaxes in there to actually get the final um, prize, so to speak. Uh, so that's one way is just identifying really clearly whether you have that climax. And then uh, when it comes to script work, you basically, if you have that plotted out, you can then start kind of attacking each one of those scenes and keeping that in mind as a global thing that you need to do to actually get your characters and your your plot pushing to that final climax, that's hopefully going to be really satisfying for your audience. Okay, that's kind of the idea here that you want to do it. Um, there is no like best way. There is no like method. I one thing that I've heard people say is that you usually start with the least important scenes first in a film, so that you can kind of build up your uh, you know, you build up your chops, you get used to the characters, and then you you finally hit your like you hit your most important marks close to the end or like just a little bit before you know your time runs out. And that way you're already warmed up, you already know what your character should be doing, and you hit those really important scenes, and you're already in their flow, and then you, you just knock it out of the park. Um, also, it usually happens that if you start somewhere, you're just kind of kind of like get into it, it's it's a little slow to get into the mindset of the characters and the flow, and you're not just gonna be moving and, and, and running you know, uh, really, really well at the beginning. So that's one way to do it. Um, just think about this too, is that this is something that you should ask your directors. This is something that you should ask the people involved with the project, is really when you're breaking down the script and the story, clearly identifying these conflicts. And if they don't know, like if you ask a director, what's the purpose of this scene? What's the story point of this scene? What's the What's the, yeah, what's the direction that this scene needs to go? And they don't know. That's where you're going to have to step in as a story artist and figure it out for them, or you both are going to have to have a discussion to figure that out before you begin, because it's going to be a real mess if you turn in something that is not what the director wanted and it's com a complete deviation from where the story should go. You should make really clear arguments that this scene serves this purpose for this reason, and if it doesn't serve that purpose, it should not be in the story, right? Or you got to rework it and do something like that. So, um, so that's kind of a long-winded uh, answer to your question <laughs> to see how you know it, what's a, what's a one method to doing it. But uh, I I would just say just to sum up real quick is just to understand really clearly what your goals are for the scene, identify the conflict, and then you can start executing your thing hopefully in a better way, right? Um, yeah, John Claude has got my back here. He says, uh, figure out the end first, as do writer, as writers do, and it gives you at least a destination on how to end the story. I, I, I think that's really good advice. That is really strong to, um, to know where you're going first, and then you can kind of figure out the path to that. It's really rare that you're just going to start a story, and especially when it comes to boarding it out, because it takes effort to do these drawings and actually create a full story reel. Uh, to actually just randomly, you know, make something and and see where it ends up, because what you're most likely going to have is just a real disorganized mess of what happens in that story. So I'm one that that follows a method that you figure out the path, you have a, you mark these key moments and key journey points of the character, and you plot these out really well, and then when it comes down to each individual scene, you know how that fits into the bigger picture. That's really what I'm getting at here. The cool thing, if you actually graph this out and you plot it out, so you have a character that starts here, it goes up, he might have a couple wins, but then he goes down, he has a couple of losses, right? And, you know, wins and losses, I'm saying that something good might happen to him, something bad might happen to him, right? Just making up a random character story here. Then he, he keeps on growing, he's, he's like moving in the right direction, so that thing is going up, and then all of a sudden, boom, he gets hit with, uh, you know, something that we didn't expect, and it sends him in the wrong negative direction, but then he's got to work his way back up again. It's like Rocky, right? He's, he's got to fight and you know, train and build. And when you get to the final match, that's the climax. What's going to happen? Is he going to beat um, you know, his opponent? That's all the setup that happens there. And, it, and hopefully you, you deliver that in a way that, that is, not, um, is not predictable to the audience. Too. Like the, For example, that Rocky movie that just came to my head, uh, the ending is not what you expect. He actually loses that first uh, uh, major title fight, right? And uh, and even though he's like giving it all, even though he's lost, he really hasn't lost. That's the cool part is that he actually the effort that it took to get there and he went the distance um, with Apollo Creed may, means that he he really won. And then the love story there really tightens it up. 
So, <laughs> so that's that's super cool. Um, so a couple questions coming in. Let me let me just like wheeze through these. Yes. Awesome that you guys are, are talking about this stuff too. So, um, well, right, before I get to this one, let me let me continue with this uh, path because that's going to send us to a different subject. Um, I want to want to bring up this comment from Chad. So, from a writing perspective, I tend to work from the from the end first to know where I'm going to. From a storyboard, if I'm given a full script, I try to figure out what the most important scenes are needed first, and then I'll ensure I have a script. Uh, understood so I know what these characters are when I'm putting together those moments yeah that's other really good comment and good advice I, I think that's great you just got to have clarity man you have to be able to make sure that what you show to your audience is clear and you send them on a journey that's going to be entertaining and unpredictable you really want to make it unique and that to me is part of the entertainment value that's why I love like Coen Brothers movies I could never predict how those films are going to end up because they take you twisting in, in different directions. And that's what is so fun to watch a film from those guys because they have such a originality and uniqueness to the characters. And then the, the way they send these characters in, in whichever direction, it hasn't been predictable for me. So I think those are cool. Now, not every film that they've made is great, but I think over, overall, they're really, really strong filmmakers to, to study and, and understand what they've been doing. So we got a we got a previous question here. Let me bring this up. This is awesome. So Alan ninety four five forty four had a question about previs. When is a good time to use it with a three D environment, or does it depend on the studio you work under? Uh, okay, let me take that first part of the question because that that is that's a that's a good one, and it has to you got it takes a long uh, answer to kind of dissect this. So. When is it a good time to use um, previs and with a 3D environment? So you gotta, I, I looked at this because, I, okay, let me back this up and give you a little bit of background. I worked a lot in previs. I worked a lot with 3D assets, with uh, 3D end product film. So like 3D animated film. So the Clone Wars, all the stuff I was doing at Lucasfilm was all 3D. In fact, when I was at Pixar, that's all 3D. Um, I've worked on a couple 2D uh, projects as well, but really, when the end product is 3D, this is where I realized, and I thought it was a really good thing that we discovered, and we were pushed to do this with, with the Lucasfilm projects, was that the end product is in 3D, so why not use the assets that we're going to be using in 3D anyway? And you can be also, also use the cameras that you're going to be using in the end final product. So that was one of the big reasons why we started using Previs or 3D Story, is we used the actual cameras with the actual characters. Uh, you know, they were proxy models, but they were you know, low res models that we can put in there and put them in the environment sometimes. And at least it would be a one-to-one -one representation of what we wanted in that shot. So that's one of the reasons that you would use previs. And so the other question, the other part to your question is, does it depend on the studio that you work with? Absolutely. Because there are studios that are doing 3D projects, but they will board out completely the traditional way with 2D storyboards. And that's great. You can get a lot of 3D uh, effects and a lot of really dynamic camera work just by doing 2D uh, storyboards, especially nowadays with um, with the tools that are out there. And it's because the, they don't have budgets to have modelers or make you proxy models and stuff. So then it's you know you just don't have the assets to work with. You can mock it up with something like Toon Boom or even SketchUp uh, and some of these other programs. If you know how to use Maya, you can you can mark up things really quickly. But um, and then you go into a 3D background, you can take some snapshots. We did that too, also at Lucasfilm. So we would take snapshots inside of Maya or something, and, or whatever 3D program we're using, and we take a snapshot of the background. That was the actual real background with the camera that we wanted, say like a 35 millimeter camera or 75 millimeter camera, whatever it was. And we had that as the background plate, and over that we would draw the characters in, in 2D. It would just make it, um, uh, we it just made it faster. It was a faster workflow. We didn't have to like redraw the backgrounds every single time, especially when we were doing like moving shots or tracking shots, which get, it gets a little bit complicated to redraw again and again the background. Um, you can do shortcuts, which is also part of the equation here too, um, but it does look slightly cleaner if you're if you're using the real 3D background and you just have like painted over you know 2D animated characters on top. So that's that's kind of a cool method to do that. Um, Anyway, not to uh, 
not to go too long on this previous idea, but the key here is one of the, the factors for me is speed. So that if it's faster for me to draw a 2D storyboard and knock out the story point, which is the whole exercise for doing storyboards, you got to reveal the point of the scene, reveal the story point and, and the conflict and everything else that we've been talking about today. If you can do that faster in 2D storyboards, uh, even digitally or whatever, however you want to do it, then using 3D, I would say do it in 2D. Because oftentimes you open up a 3D package, you start animating something, you bring in cameras, you bring in the background. By the time you do that, it takes you days instead of a couple of hours of doing uh, 2D boards. And so it's just, to me, whatever's faster. Now there, there is a point, and we got this at Lucasfilm, where everything was there for us. So we grabbed the background, we grabbed the characters, we could put in the camera, and it was all moving really, really fast. And we could almost do, well, it would, it would be better, in fact, it was better to do really complicated um, action shots for like spaceship battles in 3D, in the 3D space, because uh, all those elements were there, and it would look much more accurate to what we could do with 2D. Um, that being said, there were some guys on our, on our team there that were so skilled with doing 2D work that they would do space battles in 2D, and they, and they turned out fantastic. So that's, <laughs> that's great, too. Um, great question, by the way. Uh, all right, cool. Um, yeah, so you kind of you kind of get what I'm talking about with, with the backgrounds. Uh, you got to keep in mind too. I should say this: that a storyboard is a temporary thing that is serving a purpose. We're not making a finished oil painting. This is not like a, a portrait that you're painting of a client that you have to make sure that there's like super polished. It's going to hang in a museum. And in fact, it's it's the exact opposite. These things are throwaway images. It's really that temporary. And the reason why is because you're not making art, you're solving story problems, okay? You see the difference there? Now, in the process of solving story problems, if you make art, great. <laughs> if you have really awesome storyboards that you can hang on the wall, that's fantastic, or print out if you're doing digital boards. But the point is to solve and fix and, and create really cool, interesting story moments. It's not really about creating awesome storyboards. Now, that, I know that might hurt some of you guys be like, oh, man, I really want to be a great artist. I want to be a great draftsman. I got into this because I love drawing and I love art. So, But after, our, after our, a number of years, you, know, you realize that the point of what we're doing here and, and the, the reason you create storyboard shortcuts and you have a drawing method that, that creates speed and you get faster is so that you can start resolving the story issues better and faster in that way, okay? And you're less concerned about the drawing. This just happened naturally for me. I just started co like concerning myself less about the actual execution of the, the stroke and the drawing and the shading and this and that. But that the communication of the idea was, uh, was really clear. Now, that doesn't mean you can be sloppy with any of your work. That doesn't mean you can have poor perspective or bad anatomy or not have good drawing skills. You still have to have those things. But that is, those are there to serve a purpose to solve your story problems. That's really the main point here, <laughs> okay? That's something really, um, really important, right? It's good. Um, Rick is asking a question here. How long does it take to do an initial storyboard for a 30-minute story? Um, and story not shot, okay? So how long does it take to do an initial storyboard for a 30-minute story, I think is what your question is. Um, it takes a long time, my friend. <laughs> okay, think about this. I uh, one one script page is about one minute. This is just on average, right? This is the average thing. Uh, one script page is about a minute of action in a story. So if you got a thirty-minute story, you got thirty pages of a script. Thirty pages of script. Um, you know, each depending on your level of finish, could take uh, could take weeks to to actually. Um, to, to execute. So let me give you an example. We had, we sometimes got 30 page scripts for a 21 minute uh, episode of something like Rebels or, or Resistance, right? So the Lucasfilm projects that I worked on, Clone Wars too. So these like incredibly long scripts were, were, were so, um, we thought were so bloated because we knew that we we're going to have to cut at least uh, seven pages or so out of that script in the process of doing the storyboarding, right? So 
theoretically, we would, on average, is about a 25 to 28 page script that we would get that we would trim down to 21 minutes of screen time. And to board that out, we had four guys, I believe, working at eight weeks. So four by eight, we're talking about um, 48 weeks of, right, is my math correct? 48 weeks of, um, of man time to create this uh, 20, let's say, let's use random numbers. Well, in this case, it was a 21 minute story reel, okay? So that's a tremendous amount of time that it's gonna take for one person to execute one project. So um, if you have a 30 minute story and you have like, yeah, script pages are, are you know, regardless, let's say you have a script or not, um, that it's still gonna take you a long time. You know, I don't know if it's gonna be exactly 48 weeks, um, you know, talking about man hours, but you know, you can, there are ways to reduce that down, certainly with the amount of finish that you're doing. I personally boarded out um, almost 90 pages of a, of a feature story myself in, in about three months, you know, two and a half to three months. And that was a tremendously difficult uh, project. And that was the, the, the little boy film that I worked on. Um, it was difficult me, for me to, to keep that pace and actually execute everything that we wanted to do in that, that film. So I had to really, really be economical with my execution. And if you look at the drawings, they're really simple because that was the only way I was gonna meet that deadline. Um, and so that was like, I would say that's close to, I don't know, maybe 70 or 80 minutes of screen time that, that I was boarding out there. So you can, there's ways to adjust this stuff. So just keep in mind, I think if you have a story that is 30 minutes or so, that is, uh, that's awesome. But then what you wanna do there is uh, figure out, like, you're, like we're talking about here, the most important points, board those out, um, and then some of the other like filler moments, you can play a little bit fast and loose. So not everything has to be uh, perfectly executed to 100% quality, okay? <laughs> um, hopefully that gets you to the right point, right? Um, yeah, anyway, uh, let's, let's get to some of these other questions and then, uh, and then I think we're gonna have to call it for today. Yeah, so yeah, there's a great conversation going on on Facebook with all this stuff. So that's the part of it. I think what you want to do, just so it's not so overwhelming, is to, uh, to get started, to understand what your what your point is for the story, hit your climax, your major beats, your your act breaks, right? And then put those into a story reel, very loose, like a first rough pass, and then you start refining, you start refining, you start refining. Um, and that way you can you're gonna do. You're gonna end up doing multiple story passes. You never, you never really do a storyboard pass one time. That's very rare, <laughs> especially with complicated narrative projects like, um, like an episodic TV show or a feature. You're gonna end up boarding and reboarding and doing it again and iterating on it till you get it right. That's the whole reason you do it. And that's the other thing for storyboards. Is this is one of the reasons why they are some, somewhat temporary and throwaway images. Is so that you can reboard and do it again, and it doesn't hurt as much. It's a budgetary thing. You want to make sure that these are fast and efficient. That's that's what you want to get out. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, I, bet, I think you guys are kind of getting what uh, the point of what I'm <laughs> what I'm uh, getting at here with with the complexity of being a story artist. Now, I don't want you to like for these guys who haven't done this to like scare you off. That's not the, that's not the point. The point is, do you have a good story? If you don't have a good story, you have to do the work. Whether you draw it or you, or you do previs or you do puppet or toothpick animation, whatever it is that you're doing, you still have to have a good story. You gotta figure it out. Without a good story, you have nothing, my friends. That's the real point, is you have to make sure that it's gonna be entertaining for your audience. And you have to do the work one way or the other. So if you have the drawing skills, great. You're gonna use storyboards and you're gonna use this process I'm talking about to get you to the final result. If you don't, well, Maybe you can hire some of us so we can help you out. <laughs> That's the first step. But if you really don't and have no budget, then you have to figure out the, the, the moments. And if you do with photographs or, you know, like I'm saying, cardboard cutouts or whatever method it is to actually solve those story issues, you still have to do that, okay? There is no way around creating a magical story. You have to think about it, you have to elaborate on it, and you have to create that process. That's really the, the meat about what we're doing. Okay, <laughs> that's why it's so important what we do. That's why being a story artist is a highly valued discipline that you need to be well-trained and you also need to have the mindset and creativity to be able to solve these problems. 
and it is a ton of fun when you get into this. Like storytelling is just, it's like a drug, man. You just, you, you love it. You get, you get bit by this bug that you want to do it over and over again and create this. It's really, really great. So um, yes, it's hard. It's not easy, but the, the enjoyment and the fulfillment that I get from doing this is wonderful. That's why I think um, for those of you who, let's say some of you guys might be new to this and, and trying it out, um, then you know it's hard at first. But then if you, the more you do it, the easier it's going to get. The thinking process gets easier and you start resolving and making uh, very cool uh, story decisions later on. Okay. So hopefully, hopefully that uh, rings true for everybody out there. And, you know, let us know how this process goes. That's another reason why I like doing these chats is so that we can keep in touch and uh, keep on top of the projects that you guys are doing. All right, my friends, I'm going to jump out for now, but this is a great discussion. And I encourage you all to come to our social media, uh, come to our Facebook group. And uh, so that's Facebook, uh, uh, Storytellers uh, United on Facebook. And come to our website to check out some of the, um, the resources that we have there. You can sign up for free. All that good stuff is there for you to learn and improve and share your stories too. So if you have something good to share, by all means, come on, share it with us so we can actually take a look at it and get inspired uh, as well. All right, friends, we'll talk soon. See you later.